Today, I am going to depart a bit from the physics. Um, so there are no more equations today. But we're going to use the stuff we learned on Monday and Tuesday about free energy. And now we're going to look at protein structure again. But we're going to look at it with slightly different eyes. So I'm going to try to come back and interpret what we see or what we don't see in terms of free energy in particular. So everything we see in these slides, the reason we see the structures we see is because they are favorable from a free energy point of view. Yes. Today, I was opponent in Aarhus in Denmark, and a poor student, uh, she passed actually, awesome thesis. Uh, but I kept tormenting her for two hours about free energy. Uh, and the funny thing, even on the PhD level, right? She's a PhD in medicinal chemistry, understanding how new serotonin related drugs work against depression. And the way these drugs are designed, uh, they target a number of different transporters and ion channels that Lucy will talk a little bit more about on Monday. But what determines how they work is what receptors are they binding? What are they doing to the receptors? And all those things can be interpreted in free energy stabilization, determining what binds what and why it's stabilized in the right binding post. So it's the stuff we went through earlier this week. It's not just a theoretical exercise. It's a foundation for almost everything we do, both in my lab and a whole lot of other biophysics research groups, not to mention experimental studies, of course. But today, we're going to be looking at real proteins, not just small secondary structures, but the real workhorses, the building blocks that do things in your body. There are a bunch of different uh, concepts here that we're going to talk about. I'm not going to, I think I will, I'm not going to spend time on this slide, but I'll go through them piece by piece. There are, broadly speaking, three big classes of proteins. Um, the ones you've probably seen most are these small small proteins that work in solution, like, like hemoglobin binding oxygen in your blood or an antibody or something. I'm going to go through them the second half of the lecture today. The first half of the lecture today, I'm going to talk about seemingly boring proteins, the building material, uh, large so-called fibrous proteins that form large structures such as skin, bone, and other things. And it's by sheer quantity, it's by far the most abundant proteins in your bodies. Uh, so you need to know a little bit about them. But from a biochemical and, <clears throat> from my point of view, biophysical point, these are more interesting. And then on Monday, I need to participate in a Plan S seminar about publication in the European Union. So then Lucy, sadly, gets to give the really fun lecture about our research topics about membrane proteins, and I'm jealous about that. But uh, I, I bet she's going to give a great lecture. And this is the really fun stuff, because then you're then you're literally looking at machinery, determining how ions go through membranes and everything. It's super related to nervous signaling and everything. There are a number of different tools to study proteins. You remember that movie I showed you by uh, Cyrus Leventhal, uh, that they created the first way of actually visualizing proteins in three dimensions. Today, you can just go download it. There are a number of uh, programs, but I would particularly like to throw a little fact one called VMD that is developed by close friends of ours at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. There are also slightly more than the 300 proteins that were available when I was your age. Um, so that today, if I would like to say a particular protein, hemoglobin, these proteins are represented with small four-letter codes. Um, so if I'm going to tell you that you should look at a particular structure, I might tell you to look at 1HBD, and then you can just go to a database, and then you enter this short code, and then you will download a very simple text file that just contains all the coordinates of this protein. I'm going to, or Lucy actually, will give a, a lecture about bioinformatics too later on in the course, and then we're going to show that there are similar type of databases for sequences and everything. And a whole lot of them making sense about things is starting from all these millions of sequences, and being able to predict this type of structures from sequences. Why do we want to predict structure from sequence, and why can't we do it? Two questions. Why do we want to do it? What was the central dogma of molecular biology? Sequence to structure to function, right? So the function is determined by the structure. On the other hand, we also know from Christian Anfilsen that a sequence will fold into a unique structure, right? So if I know the sequence, the information about the structure is encoded in the sequence. It's just, it's not obvious that we will know it. But why don't we just determine the structure instead? That seems stupid. If we want the structure, why on earth do we determine the sequence? Mm -hmm. 
Well, so the difference is determining a structure, in particular of a difficult protein, can easily be a two-year project. Uh, and in some cases, you can't do it all. Remember that 100,000 proteins sounds like a lot, but those are all the protein structures that have been determined since the early 1970s. And it's not a whole lot by those standards. We probably determine, well, not we, but the, the genome centers worldwide probably determine more than 100 through 1,000 new genomes, uh, sorry, protein sequences per day. So that determining new sequences is something you do with 24-hour turnaround. Um, there are even some genetic rare diseases, uh, in particular with newborn babies and everything. If you don't know what, uh, if you don't know what's wrong with them, today we sequence their blood. Um, take a blood sample, and within three or four days, you can have their entire genome sequenced, and then you can scan through and hopefully find a mutation and realize what the disease is. And of course, in that perspective, you need to do it in mere days, so that it's cheaper and more efficient to determine sequences. Uh, so if we if we have good ways to determine the structures from the sequences, we can understand, for instance, if you have an alanine instead of a valine residue, uh, what disease will that lead to in the protein? Will this cause it to bind something else, uh, for instance, the serotonin receptor? You might get a chance to play around with this a bit in the labs or not. Uh, and that depends on what Burke is going to have you do there. The reason why we get the amino, uh, the proteins we have is, of course, due to the amino acids, as we spoke about. Um, all amino acids are not created equal. We need all 20 of them, but there are some that are more different than others. For instance, alanine or isoleucine or leucine, they're all small and hydrophobic, and the differences are not that large. But there are a handful of them where you need to, if you, even if you're just scanning through a sequence, you need to be able to react and realize, oh, that's likely significant. Proline was one of them. If you have a, an alpha helix prediction and you suddenly see a proline, you realize that proline is going to break the alpha helix. Why? Because proline can't create the hydrogen bonds that is necessary. So if you put a proline in an alpha helix, you will get a kink in the helix. It will break it right away. Glycine is very small, so it's going to be common in tight turns. And there are a few other amino acids that are good to have a gut feeling about. There are a bunch of properties. Um, a few years ago, my father is a professor of my, well, a few, Jesus, time flies. 15 years ago, I wrote a paper together with my father, who's a professor of medical microbiology, and he's now retired. Uh, and then I wrote a lot of sequences that what are all these letters? So even, even one generation ago, everybody used explicit three letter codes for every amino acid. So if you were, if you see the Sanger paper that I had earlier in the course, they will spell out every amino acid. You will say, Pro dash ALA dash Gly dash Met dash ILE dash Leo. Makes sense, right? The only problem, there are so many sequences today that we don't have room for that. So what we've all converted to is that we're using this single letter codes uh, and then we don't bother with dashes. So we just write straight letters. That also makes it much easier if we can compare the letters in columns and see how they align to each other. And we'll come back to that in bioinformatics. There are a couple of tricks here. I don't expect you to know these by heart, but R, genine, for instance, that R. Most of them are the first letter, but not all of them, not all of them. The other thing that you might see here already, what you have out here in the rightmost column is the delta G of solvation. And in the second rightmost column is the abundance. That is how frequent they were. Do you remember what determined this abundance? Do you see that some of them are more, much more common than others? Why is cysteine so rare while, for instance, serine? is much more common, or alanine, or leucine for that matter. Well, it depends on how many uh, codons. Exactly. So this depends entirely on the codons, not whether it's good or bad to have them in the protein. This is encoded in the genetic code. This delta G of solvation, um, what could you use that for? Do you see some there? Um, arginine, for instance, uh, roughly minus 60. What does that mean? And what should you compare it to? So solvation is the free energy change. You, delta G solvation is the free energy change we would get if we put this in water, right? So we take it from vacuum or a salt and put it in water. So minus 60 means that you win free energy. That's a favorable process. So that's going to happen spontaneously. Is it good or is it, or is it slightly good, OK, or insanely good? when it's minus 60. What do you compare it to? Insane. Why? Guessing is not enough. So what, there is a number you need to compare that to. And the H bonds energy between uh, water 
Mm, yeah, well, yes. Actually, that's not, it, 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 you could argue that that's very, very, but in particular, if I change the temperature, what is our, temp, what is our scale of energy determined by? So, this, of course, the H bonds are relevant too. What's the energy of an H bond? Two to five kcals or so. But what is, what is our energy scale? We can say that the unit is kcal, but in biophysics, it's, or physics for that matter, it's, in, it's instructive to think in a temperature dependent scale, kT, right? Because you always say E raised to the power of an energy divided by kT, or minus an energy. So what is kT in kcals or kilojoules? It's one of those. It's virtually guaranteed to appear on the exam, uh, or if not directly, indirectly. Uh, 2.5 kilojoules, or 0.6 kcals. Uh, and I'm not going to kill you to say 0.5, but you need, you need to have the gut feeling of that. And that the second something is an order of magnitude larger than that, it will always happen. The reaction will never go in the opposite direction. So the likelihood of taking an arginine and moving that to the inside of a membrane, it's not going to happen. I would eat my left shoe, <laughs> literally. Uh, and same thing if you take something very hydrophobic, it's never going to be in water. It will always be on the inside. So many things in biophysics, in contrast to physics where you want to calculate things exactly, that the gut feeling or the hand waving things are actually way more important. You're going to need to, will it happen or not? Uh, I have a couple of slides on the amino acids, but I'm not going to spend that much time on it. So both glycine and alanine, they're fairly boring small residues. Um, glycine especially in that it's super flexible, so you can see it a lot in turns, but we went through that a little bit on the Ramachandran diagram lecture already, so I'm not going to spend so much time. Uh, I don't think we're going to talk specifically about protein structure, too, but you might at some point see, do you remember that I said that there was a C alpha? And that's the central carbon, that's why we call it alpha. If you just keep going out the side chain, um, well, if you're, if you're native Greek, you have an advantage here, because you just keep enumerating the carbon alpha, vita, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta. Uh, so that the further out you go in the side chain, you just increase the numeration, uh, the letters in the Greek alphabet. Uh, but that's also kind of sidetracking a bit. Cysteine is a residue that I'm going to talk a little bit about later today. So that I will bring out. Cysteine is seemingly a normal residue, but it has a sulfur here. So normal, you, normally you have an SH group, uh, but these can oxidize to form a disulfide bridge, sulfur, sulfur, and that's a real covalent bond, not an ionic bond or anything, and not a hydrogen bond. And that literally means that there is now a new bond linking two chains together. And the second you've done that, the protein can't move, those can't move aside, because you've literally formed a, not a knot, but glued them together. So what you would have once, one protein chain on the left and one on the right, but now you also literally have a chain across here. That can occasionally be good if you really want to lock something in, uh, but it's, of course, a fairly dramatic reduction of uh, entropy, too. But the reason why it would happen has to do with the oxidization here, that it's so much more favorable to form that bond. Why would you possibly want to do that? I'll show you an example. Um, we've looked a little bit about um, protein and protein structure. Does this like, like, look like an interesting protein structure? This looks like a shoelace somebody just threw in water or something, right? Looks completely unintelligible. Um, you can add all the atoms if you want, and it doesn't really make more sense. It just looks random. But now I'm going to add, show you the cysteines, and in particular the sulfurs. Do you see that there is one, two, three bridges across there, right? So although this doesn't have any secondary structure, but it has a bunch of cysteines that still locks the chain together, and that means that this is actually a stable fold. It doesn't look like it. Um, this is a toxin from uh, a tarantula, if I recall correctly. It's called HANA toxin. It actually has a fun story. It was Kenton Schwartz who discovered this, uh, and then he couldn't come up with a name, so he named it after his daughter, uh, and it apparently made his wife furious uh, first. But Ten years later, when the daughter is 15 year, was 15 years old, it's pretty cool to have a toxin named after you. <laughs> um, so why would you have that? 
So this is a type of protein that should be super stable, right? Because it occurs in a very toxic environment. The toxin itself might try to destroy other things. You want something that is difficult for the, uh, the, uh, the other animals and uh, antibodies or something to break down. So you literally want something that's so super stable that no amount of unfolding or hydrogen bond or temperature should be able to destroy it. And that's usually a characteristic of, of things like toxins, that they should be hard to destroy and disrupt. And here too, we can fill it in and getting all the surfaces and everything. And here too, you might see, this is the reason why I actually had that link to VMD. There are multiple different ways to visualize a protein. And how you should visualize depends what you want to get out of it. Do I want to, I actually, I, I really like to just see the backbone of potentially disulfide bridges because like just understanding the topology is much more important to me than seeing all the details or seeing all the atoms. Uh, if you look at these, I would say that the far least instructive but that is the least instructive one for me because you can't see the forest or all the trees. There's too much information. The other amino acid I spoke about was proline. Uh, proline is actually not an amino acid. Everybody has been lying until they, formally proline is an amino acid. Uh, and if you're a chemist, that is a really important distinction, but we are physicists, so we're gonna call it an amino acid. Uh, the big difference with proline is that it doesn't have the nitrogen there is not free. Uh, and that means that it can't form as many hydrogen bonds for uh, and in particular that means that it's, it can't sit in a helix because in a helix you depend on the hydrogen bonds being formed by every single residue. So it's simply this loop, this five member ring here takes too much space. This you can use if you're trying to predict secondary structure, if you don't know what it is and suddenly you see a proline in the sequence that is an exceptionally strong indication that there can't be a helix here. Or if there is a helix and you wonder how long the helix is, the second you see a proline, the helix will stop. So this is something 20 years ago, we used information like this to try to predict protein structures. What do you think we use today? Deep learning. So there are so many proteins known. Uh, so we just trained computers on available structures and in particular use the fact that we have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of related sequences and that makes it possible to see very, very weak patterns. But uh, Lucy will come back to that in the bioinformatics lecture. And the final, promise, the final uh, amino acid I'm going to mention, it's tryptophan. Tryptophan is a very large and bulky amino acid, so it has one five-member ring and one six-member ring, where the five-member ring has an NH group, so it's slightly polar actually, and the this is a completely hydrophobic ring. This is so large that it's almost like two amino acids. Uh, and in particular, this large and non-polar thing is definitely not going to be a water. So that's something that you would like to turn to the inside. And this was a, there was a famous paper in 2004, uh, 2002, it says there, uh, when they managed to create an artificial protein. So it's because at some point, if you just take two, three amino acids and pull them together in polypeptide chains, at what point does this start to be a protein? If one amino acid is one amino acid, you can talk about two amino acids and at some point, if there are multiple peptide bonds, we like to call it the polypeptide chain. But when does, when does a polypeptide chain become a protein? So first, it has to fold into something well-defined. Not every sequence will do that. Um, just because it's, it's just like any random parts won't form a car. Um, but the other thing that we like to say that it has to fold into something well-defined where there, there is some sort of buried interior that does not have access to water. So this TRP case, this is a super small protein in the bulb, it's under 20 residues, uh, where the buried part is really a big tryptophan residue here. And I'm gonna show you a small movie made by colleagues of ours uh, from 10 years ago. And this is going to be fairly fast. When you see this starting from a stretched out chain, we're now going to see that you don't throw. There's actually water all around this, but I removed the water because if I showed the water here, you wouldn't see the protein. So let's see what happens when we pull this in water. This takes a few microseconds so that this has still collapsed a bit, but there isn't really any stable structure. And at some point, you see that it's starting to turn to the inside. And I think it will flip out again, and then it will flip in, and then eventually we're going to form some sort of so you see that it keeps flipping in and out. It's not really sure whether it, where it wants to go. And I think that's the stable state. Uh, so this is characteristic of how proteins fold and very much related to this Leventhal paradox that it's, it's kind of searching see my randomly, right? 
But the one thing you did not see, you did not see a single frame where the entire chain was stretched out from the left all extended to the right. Because that is just one single state and the likelihood of seeing that is exceptionally low. Then of course, the second we start to form some favorable interactions, say that we turn the hydrophobic residues to the inside, that is a very favorable change in free energy. Because now basically the hydrophobic effect, right? Like turning the oil drops to each other. The second I've done that, it's very unlikely that I will take a step back. Formally, theoretically I can, but again, the likelihood that oil will spontaneously spread out in water, the likelihood is so low that in practice in chemistry we say it doesn't happen, which is a lie. In physics it can happen. Uh, but that also means that based purely on probability, it, there is some sort of built-in arrow here that we tend to, we fluctuate, we diffuse back and forth, but in general there is a net progression towards the folded states, and that's what you saw here too. But then occasionally we realize we were heading in the wrong direction, and we unfold and we refold again. But the closer you get to the folded state, the more favorable interactions we've formed, and the less likely it is that we're going to disrupt all of them and head all the way back. Although it does happen now and then. I spoke before about polar charge residues, and my only reason for repeating that here is it's important that just as hydrophobic residues will turn to the inside, all these polar residues will be seen on the surface. Uh, and I also mentioned a little bit how they stabilize N versus uh, the beginning versus the end of the helix. And I also mentioned that they can change the charge. I'm not going to spend time on that. It's not so important. So I think that's, oh, actually, there is a small part. What you're seeing here, this is a small movie of one of our ion channels. It's a very small part of this ion channel where we're actually seeing where we're changing the pH value that changes the charge state of a few amino acids. And when we change this charge state, it will actually cause the entire channel to close here. Uh, and if you want to try this at home tonight, uh, you can actually have a glass of wine or two or a beer, just for the sake of science, of course. Um, but just to confirm that this works in your bodies too. Um, it's exactly the same processes, uh, although I think the effect with the beer is going to be the opposite, that you will open these tents. So I, the net outcome of that, I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to uh, learn this table by heart, but the take home message from all these proteins, amino acids tend to occur in places where they stabilize protein structure. Or conversely, protein structure we tend to form the structures that are stabilized by the amino acids. So which is it? Is it the amino acid that causes the structure or the structure that causes the amino acids? We touched upon that in an earlier lecture. So in principle, it should be easy for you to say what it is. So it should defer the amino acids. Determine sure. Why? So yes, so here's the point. Um, you could argue that if I have a large protein and it at, pos at a certain position, say that alanine should be the best one, right? Uh, and let's say that all your genomes have alanine, uh, but then one genome has a tryptophan there instead. So that individual, but, but that's just one amino acid. It can't really be that unfavorable for one individual to have a tryptophan in this protein. They should still fold, right? They likely will fold actually, but if you just make one amino acid. The only problem is that for everything that tryptophan can do in that position, alanine will likely do it better. For instance, if it's, well, alanine and tryptophan is a bad example. Let's say that it's on the surface and we replace uh, arginine with an alanine. So arginine is better. You can put an alanine there. It's not an extremely hydrophobic residue, but it's slightly worse than arginine. And the problem here is that through billions of years in every single individual, having an alanine there I can do everything you can do, but I can do it slightly better. And it always creates a small advantage. And this small advantage will be amplified due to natural evolution. And then you can argue that at some point there is a second random mutation in this protein. Now, the individual that has two mutations will die because that protein won't be able to survive. But the other individual that already had, a, that already had arginine, they can withstand one more mutation. So there are these very, very small and mild effects, but due to natural evolution, nature is fairly brutal in the sense that it weeds out anything that is not optimal. And from that point of view, that unless an amino acid stabilizes a particular structure, 
there will always be random mutations. And many random mutations will sadly lead to the fetus dying because it's not viable. But and nature will constantly try trial and error in every single position. Um, it's in your bodies too. I bet that you have a bunch of mutations that are more favorable than either of your parents. And conversely, you probably have some mutations that are less favorable. And this will go on through generation and generation and generation. And the likelihood of you having less offspring is, of course, it's a minute effect. It's epsilon, right? But epsilon multiplied by a million generations starts to become large numbers. So with that, I'm going to spend a little bit talking about fibrous proteins. They're not quite as, I, I, it's unfair to call them boring. Uh, these are the structural building blocks in your body. Uh, they're less specific. And the reason why they're less specific is you have to repeat them. Uh, and nature runs out of imagination. Because you need to repeat them until you get structures of macroscopic extension, as in nails, fibers, hair, shells, claws, these things, right? So that they can be millimeters or even centimeters of size. And you can't have a protein that contain a billion different residues. Um, so you need to have this more, just as we had alpha helices and beta sheets, we need to have building blocks here too that we repeat. Uh, and there are frequently lots of hydrogels. One of the simplest ones you've touched, silk. Silk is virtually pure beta sheets. Uh, so beta sheets are smooth and nice. So it's roughly 80% anti-parallel beta sheets, lots of glycine. Can you imagine glycine being related to something in silk? It's an extremely smooth and flexible structure, right? So these are, again, they're, they're firm and everything milled together. Um, there is also, it's packed in hydro, every single side is hydrophobic and the other one is hydrophilic. So you tend to have hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. That also packs them very well. If you head out into a, an expensive hairdresser or something, you can probably buy, I'm not sure whether it's so popular, but a few years was very popular to sell shampoo and everything that they contain silk protein. And then I guess they put that on the label to be able to charge more for it. Silk protein has nothing whatsoever to do with, actually, well, it does have nothing to do with silk, but it's not extracted from silk. Silk protein is just protein engineering and synthesize amino acids like look like this, and then you add it artificially, completely artificial. Uh, it probably, it costs a bit, um, probably a few dollars per ton. Uh, it's dirt cheap. But of course, if you say silk protein on the bottle, you can charge a couple of dollars more per bottle. Uh, but it has absolutely nothing to do with real silk, apart from the hydrogen. So that, this is almost like a crystal. Beautiful and repeated uh, and everything. It's a super simple structure. Collagen is another structure that you might not have heard. This is a super special helix, and I don't expect you to, uh, I don't expect, let's see, I think I can move. Yes, I can move. This is a very special, with lots of proline. So it doesn't really, the individual, amino acid chains here, they don't really seem to form anything that's stable. But when you put three of these together, do you see that they're forming hydrogen bonds to each other and waters? So this leads to very long, this is glycine proline, it's tons of proline in it. Uh, so normally it wouldn't form anything that's stable, but in this case it does. Uh, this is roughly a quarter of all the protein in your body. All the boring stuff, bone, teeth, skin, and everything. It's kind of important to have. Yes? That's a fibrous protein. Yes, all these, all these large fiber are fibrous, and that's it. They have macroscopic extension, and it's typical. They might have three to six amino acids that are repeated. So they need to be small, because otherwise, if there was a billion residues here, it would take forever for these to fold. And you can imagine the amount of these proteins that your body needs to produce just to keep up with the turnover, right? So they have to be small and simple to be able to produce them, but then we're going to need a ton of building blocks simply to reach macroscopic sizes. So they start to be fairly long. They can be, uh, well, millimeters long. There is, they in turn, these chains in turn will form an even larger chain here. Uh, so it's super chain. I think I can move that too. So here you see this triplets of chains. They're now paired, I think it's into six or nine chains here. So do you see this pattern again? You have first have amino acids, and then they form a larger structure, three chains. Now these chains can be seen as some sort of super chain. The super chains, we pack nine of them together. Because again, nature doesn't have a whole lot of imagination. And we can't have, because if we had too much imagination, it would take forever to build it. So simple building blocks that we repeat and repeat and repeat. And once you get to this size, you can actually see it in an electron microscope. So this is a dentine fibrils in, uh, in your tooth. 
if you take your genome and mutate the glycine there, remember what was the property of the glycine? Very flexible and we need that to compensate for the proteins. If you mutate that glycine to X and X is a way of writing any other amino acid. If that glycine is mutated to anything that's not small and super flexible, you get brittle bone disease. So then these structures are no longer stable. And that's when you'd have, but, uh, you, well, bone breakages, probably your teeth fall apart and everything. This is a very minute, it's basically, one, it's basically one amino acid in one gene that's changing. And as I say, because it's 25% of the protein in your body, right? There are similar effects with normal alpha helices. Uh, alpha helices are, we've, this far we've usually only looked at alpha helices one at a time. You will see a coil, coil helices. So you can take two alpha helices and then have them twist around each other like two arms, like that. I will show you a better image of that in a second. This is exceptionally important in fibers. For instance, in your muscles, in your muscle fibers, uh, you have actin and myosin, so that you basically have one fiber and then basically gripping another fiber and walking along this fiber. Uh, you, can actually, you can find movies on this online. I should have uh, borrowed one of those movies and showed you here, but I forgot. Uh, but the way muscles contract is literally, you have two of these fibers literally moving along each other. And that again, it happens in a millisecond. And I don't, well, I know how it works, but I'm still amazed that it does work. These helices are frequently, so you remember, how, do you remember how many, ter, how many amino acids there was per turn in a helix? 3.6, usually. Uh, there's 100, if, an easier way to remember that is one, every amino acid is a turn of 100 degrees. Um, you can look, instead of looking at like helix that this way, you can look at them from the top. Uh, and if you look at these from the top, what if we take this A prime and D prime and the A and D residues, these residues A and D, if we make them hydrophobic? Then they're gonna love to form pairs with each other, right? The only problem is with 3.6 turns, there's gonna be a slight offset every turn. So that, but if you take these helices and twist them just a little bit harder, so it's 3.5 turns, that actually means that we can get them to line up perfectly in the middle. So when you get hydrophobic residues, they're going to love to pair up while you turn all the water-liking residues to the outside. We will see more about that in a second. And that, that might not seem advantageous then, but the reason why that is so great that, again, if you look at the molecular structure of these helices, here it's much better to look at the surface. You can literally define these ridges, edges, and then depressions between the side chains. So the side chains sticking out will be either the solid or the dashed lines, depending on what and then there are depressions between them. So if you now take two helices like that and turn them against each other, and then you will have to rotate them a bit, you're gonna get all the edges dipping into the depressions of the other helix and they will pack perfectly. This was, yes, oh sorry, here you can see it. So you take one helix, you turn it around, and then you rotate it, and then you see that how they line up. And there is pretty much zero space here. This was predicted by Francis Crick in 1953. Pretty productive year for him. Um, he predicted protein structure and DNA structure, but apart from that, uh, why was this just as cool as the DNA structure? Remember when they, when they determined the first protein structures? A few years later, right? So again, this is the cool part. Finding this five years later after the protein structure, no big deal. Predicting it before the structures are out, very big deal. This occurs in a very common protein called alpha keratin that you might or might not have heard about. Uh, so here you see two helices coil up. Uh, what I marked in red here are leucine residues. So leucine is a hydrophobic residue, just like I mentioned. And if we place them with roughly seven, so I, in this case I don't do 3.5, but I do it every two turns. Uh, so I place every seventh residue as a leucine or at least hydrophobic. Do you see how they're gonna pair up along the helices? I will need the helices to twist slightly. Uh, so there is even a name for this, leucine zippers. Uh, so when you have these folded, that the second, the second the, say the two lowest leucines here are in contact, I pretty much force these to be at least fairly close to each other. And now they're gonna probably gonna jump together and form a hydrophobic contact. But that in turn will cause these pairs to be relative close to each other, and then they're gonna form a contact there too. So it's just literally just like a zipper you're pulling up. 
This leads to very stable structures. And the second they've coiled up like this, they're never going to release again. Uh, you might also have a fair number of residues being cysteine, uh, and then you might even have disulfide bonds between them, and then they will be even more stable. Can you imagine where this occurs? An important part of your body. Hair. This is hair. Uh, and it's more, again, it's not as simple as that, because that, so you take the alpha keratin helix, and then you form pairs of these helix, but this helix is still tiny, right? We're talking about something that's a few nanometers across. So then we're going to need to form a filament of maybe eight such pairs of helices. Then we're up to 16 helices. We're still talking about 20 angstrom, 20 nanometers or so. That's still small. Uh, so then you need to form a matrix and a macrofibril, and you're just pairing up more and more and more and more of these helix. At this point, you might probably have a few hundred or maybe a thousand of them. And then eventually you get up to the point where you have real large extensions. You might read an extension, say 0.1 millimeter or so. And at that scale, it's actually what we have in the hair. And if you've ever, well, you probably won't be in the hair. And if you create a permanent wave in the hair, what is that? Permanent in Swedish. So that you can do chemical treatments in the hair to make it stay in a certain shape, right? And there's a two-step process. Can you imagine what they do, given what I said on the last slide? Cysteines. So you first add a chemical that reduces all the cysteine bridges in the hair. And now you, the hair is very floppy. And then you form the hair to the shape you want it to be. It actually, you can form it first and then break this in. But then you add another, a second chemical that reforms the cysteine bridges in the shape you want them to be. And then you create the hair that is, you now get the, di the cysteine dial sulfides to lock in in a new structure, the structure that you prefer the hair to be in. And the permanent wave in the hair, that might be a fun parenthesis, but this is used in a ton of other features too. Actually, I, I can add that. Uh, hair grows by roughly 10 turns of alpha helix per second. So from that, you can even use that to get a rough correlation with the folding times of alpha helices. And it's going to be in the right ballpark compared to the theoretical reasoning you can do. Uh, there are plenty of other places where you use this. Uh, for instance, uh, if you're going out and buy a shirt or anything, it's very common with iron-free products, right? Iron-free products works the same way. Uh, it's not really disulfides, but there too you can basically adding chemicals that first releases the hydrogen bonds and then forms new hydrogen bonds so that you have a structure that is formed. Very simple biotech, but it's all based on uh, things that are related to physics and free energy. I think this is the final example I have. It's one called elastin, uh, and it's a very elastic fibrous protein. It's roughly similar to collagen, but it also forms very long matrices. Uh, this for this very common in say your aorta or any type of blood vessels or anything. And there's a problem here because a, as we get older, these becomes more uh, brittle and everything. Uh, and if you get an aorta aneurysm, you pretty much die. On the other, it's not entirely easy to transplant things like this too. So what you no normally do, for instance, if you have a heart attack or something, you tend to take a vein from the leg or something. Um, but in the future, we might actually be able to do artificial material. And there's a lot of research. In this case, it's an elastin biomaterial aorta here, which is completely different from the stuff that they've been trying to do at Karolinska with uh, Paolo Mazzarini and everything. Uh, so they're to not, not just based on what you can do, but if we could create artificial materials, we could make them way more biocompatible. Because the problem is that your entire body is trained to get rid of anything we put into it. Uh, any metal or anything, or it, it's even worse uh, if you have any, say, a heart, uh, a donated heart or something, your, your entire immune system will recognize that this is a strange individual that we should try to get rid of, we should try to kill this heart, and then you need to take suppressant drugs for the rest of your life. But if we could artificially construct proteins, and in particular make sure that they are compatible with your immune defense, they're not recognized as foreign material, this would basically be an infinite toolbox of spare parts for the body. I think that's all I'm going to say. And oh, we're doing great on time here. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the globular proteins the rest of today. Um, globular proteins are much more fun uh, than the fibrous ones, and they're 
colorful, beautiful pictures. Uh, and I think I'm going to start to speak a little bit about the beta sheets. Here too, there are a ton of different ways we can draw them, and I'm not going to interrogate you in different. There are lots of different structures, and again, it depends on do you want to see the large scale shape? Do I want to see the surface? Do I want to understand, say, the binding sites? Or do you want to see this on a more schematic level? Do you want to understand what are the helices, what are the beta sheets? In this case, if you saw this as space filling, you probably wouldn't even see that there are beta sheets here and helices there, right? Um, so here, by drawing it this way, I can see that all these beta sheets are parallel, and then there are helices on the outside. So you have one sheet go down, and then the helix going back, and then the next sheet go down, and the helix going back, and then the sheet goes down, and the helix going back, etc. And if you really care about it, you could do topology cartoons, but they're not very popular anymore. So I would, if I were you, I would not bore so much about that. One of the simplest structures here is beta sheets, actually. Uh, because beta sheets, remember what I said, they, have, they, actually, they look like they're super complicated. They look like something like this, right? Uh, but forget about all those loops. The important thing here is to look at the shape. So you see a sheet there, sheet there, sheet there, sheet there, and they all hydrogen bond together. Yes, they, just like a paper, you can twist it a bit, and they usually have to be twisted due to their geometry. But the pattern here is the important, not the exact shape of the loop between them. Same thing here, you have a sheet, 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 and there too you can probably see that it's gradually twisting as you go out. Uh, the reason for this twist has to do with the Ramachandran diagram. It's very close to 180 degrees, but it's not exactly 180 degrees. Uh, if, the, if the amino acid preferred to have the peptide bond and the alpha, uh, sorry, and the five side torsion, then exactly 180 degrees would be flat. But in practice, like 178 or 175. So if the structure is pretty much that you have sheets of paper, uh, what is the simplest stru structure you could imagine? Well, you could imagine having one sheet, right? But that's kind of like trying to build a house and only building one wall. It might look beautiful, and it's certainly a wall, but one wall, it's, it's not particularly useful because you can always walk around it. Uh, so there, too, it's just one floppy sheet. It's not going to do anything in your body. So that the easiest thing you can imagine is pretty much two sheets. And then there are only two ways to put them. You can put them orthogonal to each other or parallel to each other. And that's what nature has done. So again, if you look at this on the atomic level, you wouldn't see the tree and the forest for the trees. But looking at that schematically, there are only two simple ways to create very simple proteins. Both of these are used. Uh, the, this beta cylinder is something called fatty acid binding protein. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. And this is an immunoglobulin that occurs in your immune system. The reason, why, why would you imagine it could be useful to form these two layers? So I'm kind of cheating a little, it's a little bit more than two layers. So it's two layers, but I have some things on the side, right? So you, I'm not sure whether you can see it, but if you believe me for a second, we can kind of prop things up to the left and right and top and bottom, so you actually have an inside and an outside. And I agree, it's not perfectly visible here. So you remember a property of the beta sheets that you turn, the residues, they alternate. They point to one side of the sheet, and then the next residue point to the other side, and then the, you're back to the first side. So if you take any sheet, they will look like this. So if you put one res say if you put hydrophobic residue here, hydrophilic residue there, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, that's going to give you a hydrophobic side and a hydrophilic side, just like we had for the silk protein. If we now take two such proteins, then you can, well, if you have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic side and you put this in water, what would you imagine is on the inside? Ah, shit, I shouldn't have, uh, have that note. No, you know. The hydrophobic part will be on the inside, so we can turn the water liking residues to the outside. So that's like a small pocket. Uh, let's see, do I have a, uh, let's see if I have a, no, I might not. Uh, but this small pocket can actually bind a small fatty acid uh, that has to be transported elsewhere in the body. Why would you need to bind a fatty acid to transport it?
because the fatty acid is not soluble in water, right? It's fat, it's oil. And just when you're boiling pasta, if we want to transport it, we have to transport it through the blood. But by binding it to this protein, this is essentially the same thing as uh, detergent, if you're washing clothes or something. We can take the fat, bind it on the inside, now it's water soluble, we move it to the place where it should be, and then we release it. And this is how a large part of the fatty acid transport in your body works. Uh, I'm gonna, just going to give you one more example of this. This is a protein called gamma crystalline, and that's what your eye lenses are created of. Uh, also very simple protein. Uh, and you have a bunch of loops up here, and these loops are frequently created to somehow try to close the interior or something. Super simple, small structure. Do you see the pattern here? So that I have a small loop that goes in one direction and then a long loop that goes in the other. Here too, I have a small loop that goes in one direction and a long loop that goes in the other. This was discovered by Jane Richardson in 1977 and it's called a Greek key. And I'm gonna give you a break in 30 seconds here. Uh, and this is exactly the same type of pattern you see in a Greek urn or something. And the reason why this is common, it's a pattern that you can, you can draw it with a pen without lifting the pen, which is exactly the same properties as these patterns, right? That you don't have to lift the pen. Uh, but that sounds fairly stupid. It's not like we're drawing proteins. So why, what would the use be? So we want these fairly long loops because if we only had the very short loops, you could imagine just going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and having short loops everywhere. But if we only have short loops, it would make it very difficult to close the protein at the top and bottom. So we want some of these slightly longer loops to have enough material to close things so that we actually create the pockets that is excluded from the water. So it's a bit of a parenthesis, but it's one of this. It's classical result, uh, and it was, uh, I even think there was a Greek urn on the cover of Nature in 1977 when they published it. Uh, so this, if you heard the word Greek key, uh, that's going to be it. This is a good point to take a break. Uh, I stole two minutes, so let's meet here at 17 minutes past 4 p.m. And then I'll try to finish and let you go five minutes early today. Good. I will continue the last 40 minutes here. Uh, so I spoke about gamma crystalline. Uh, and these Greek keys. Oh, and they actually do have a small movie of the fatty acid binding protein. So here you see the small fatty acid bound inside the fatty acid bi uh, binding protein, an X-ray crystallography structure of it. And for this protein too, you can almost see that, well, actually here there it's not a Greek key, but you see that you have fairly long loops here that try to close it up a bit, but might not be a great visualization. So the common part of this is that there are, I think the easiest way to sum this up is that you need stable structures. To form stable structures, we need amino acids that stabilize those structures. But that in turn means that amino acids will occur in the places where they stabilize and favor the structures. So again, you have this mutual relationship that amino acids create the structure, but the structure will also create a bias of what amino acids mutations we will tolerate. Then there are some things that are rare. And most of the things that are rare are rare because they're not disadvantages. And if they're not disadvantages, they tend to be weeded out by evolution with a few exceptions. Uh, because in one, one protein in 100, it could be something that actually is good. And one such example is that proteins virtually never contain knots. So you can think of proteins as a topology, right? That is looking at a very high level. Uh, and in general, a protein can never take, let's see, if we start from blue, you normally start calling the end terminus as blue, and then we go to light blue, light blue, and you see how this protein continues here, it's green and then yellow, but then it actually goes inside the green loop here, and the red are not there. It's literally a knot. If I were to take the blue and red parts and just pull them, I would have a knot here. That can't happen. Um, the only problem is that in biology, in contrast to physics, to every rule there is an exception. Uh, and this is an exception. This is a small protein called pepsin. Uh, pepsin occurs where? You can almost guess by the name. It's in your stomach. Uh, so this is a small protein involved in breaking down amino acids, breaking down large proteins into amino acids. And that's important because that's how we get the building blocks for all our proteins. You can't synthesize amino acids. All the amino acids that we use to build proteins are what we have eaten in terms of food. 
But the problem is now that now we have a super acidic environment and everything that the entire, the point of this entire environment is to destroy proteins. And in this environment, we need some proteins to help us destroy proteins. Those proteins had better be super stable, right? Because otherwise we're gonna destroy them too. And I don't know exactly, but I would imagine that that might actually be a reason why we created pepsin like this. This possibly makes the protein exceptionally stable and harder to degrade. It can't just unfold as easy. So the pH in your stomach is basically pure sulfuric acid. It's exceptionally hostile environment. And you can continue. There are, there are lots of examples where there are things that virtually never occur. Um, there, are, there are a few things. These are common structures. They're so-called Greek keys. You have this classical, what you call beta meanders. Uh, and the meander is the concept that the rivers meander when they go back and forth through nature. And that can occur in beta sheets. But these are pretty much the only three common conformations you have. And for the rest of them, we hardly ever observe them. We don't really know why. Uh, they're just also advantages, so natural selection has killed them. I already spoke before when I spoke about prions and everything, that there are cases where you can have multiple beta sheets in particular form pairs of structure. Super important if you want to form large things. Can you imagine just the second these two proteins are just close to each other, I would bet you would likely have 10 hydrogen bonds between them here. And the second you form those 10 hydrogen bonds, they're never going to let go again. And with that, I think I'll wrap up the beta sheet structure. I realize there are lots of structures here, um, but I want to give you somehow a gut feeling for the diversity of nature. And I promise I'm not going to ask you to, you will only have to learn half of these structures by heart. Uh, no, it's the concepts that are important here. So I'm going to go back to alpha helis in a second, but beta sheets are really characterized. You have these non-local hydrogen bonds that I mentioned. This part of the sequence is not necessarily close to that part of the sequence. This could be a residue one through 10, and this might be a residue 320 through 330. So there are lots of other parts here. And that means that it might take quite long for them to form. Uh, the strands themselves are quite flexible, uh, and then you form a ton of hydrogen bonds between them. So once they form, they tend to be stuck. Uh, and there are lots of constraints. The second you form these large sheets, they can't really move a whole lot. And alpha helix, on the other hand, there you also you have roughly the same number of hydrogen bonds, but here all hydrogen bonds are local. So they form a hydrogen bonds with a residue four units further up in the helix. So that actually makes the helix itself is very rigid, uh, but it's only rigid in the sense that it's isolated. This part forms a rigid element. This entire helix is fairly free to move around because it doesn't form hydrogen bonds with other parts of the structure. Multiple helices can pack, but you don't form hydrogen bonds between two helices, at least not a whole lot of them. Uh, so in contrast to beta sheets where you have these fairly large extended sheets, with alpha helices we have a helix and then we pack many helices. And that's slightly different. Um, there too might be a movie, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Depending on how we pack them then you can add like, well, you might have a hemoglobin carrying oxygen in your blood. This is a small ion channel. Lucy will talk more about that on Monday. And this is a small protein called hemerythrin. Um, it can also bind hemoglobin. And they're in principle similar. They're, the helices tend to be roughly parallel or they form some slight angles to each other. But you would probably agree that they are, they're a bit harder to classify exactly what the differences are. I'm not sure about, well, I can say that that's a membrane protein and that isn't. But beyond that, it's a bit harder to say whether they are orthogonal or parallel or so. And just to show you more of this diversity, let's look at something very simple. Uh, we can take four simple uh, small proteins. They all consist of four helices, uh, but they're going to have very different functionality. Cytochrome C, uh, the tobacco mosaic coat virus protein, and the hemerythrin binding oxygen protein. Uh, which one of these do you think is most stable? And which one looks not very stable? The middle one looks strange, right? That look, again, looks like a bit of a shoelace thrown around. That's the most stable one. <laughs> uh, anytime you see things in nature, there is usually a reason. Uh, and sorry, I didn't say that, but in this case, when there are these bundles, they always go down and then up, down, up, down, up. So two adjacent helices, they always go in different directions. The one on the left here, cytochrome C folds. Um, we worked on that when I was a postdoc at Stanford. Um, 
These are very common in, uh, they're in the electron transport and they can bind heavy metals. Uh, and at the time we started a whole, we were interested in understanding how simple proteins fold and understand going after these very small structures is interesting and lucrative because with four helices that's simple enough that I can almost simulate it in a computer. I can at least predict it much easier than the large proteins. So when we started this with bioinformatics methods, it turns out that one of the organisms that has by far the most cytochrome C folds or cytochrome domains is a small bacterium called Chevanella onedensis MR1. And that's a heavy metal bacterium. Um, not so much in the music sense, but it definitely likes to bind them. We, had a, we even had a grant from this from DARPA, which is the US Defense Research Agency. We lost that grant two years later, unfortunately, due to the Iraq war. As that happens in the US. Suddenly they realize that they need the money for cruise missiles since that. Uh, why on earth would the US defense be interested in this? So this type of bacterium are possibly candidates for binding radioactivity. Uh, because radioactivity is frequently heavy metals like uranium and things like that. So if you could somehow get the bacteria to just spit out the bacteria, the bacteria would bind the heavy metal from the surrounding and then we could somehow dispose of or collect the bacteria in another method, you would potentially have a way to clean up radioactive contamination, which is sad but important for the US military apparently. Tobacco mosaic virus uh, was another classical discovery. Um, if you're growing tobacco, this TMV is, you can see there's small, these small black deposits on the leaves and that's absolutely horrible because it's the leaves you're interested in you're growing tobacco. So tobacco growers, they lose for 50, well, 100 years, they lost billions of dollars on this. And uh, when people started doing structural biology and had electron microscopes, they could take uh, the tobacco leaves and then try to isolate this black compound. And then you can magnify it. So this is a, this is probably the ballpark of a few hundred nanometers or something. And then you see these rods eventually, literally, in the microscope. And if you amplify it even more, uh, you get down to this roughly 50 nanometers and the rods turn into some sort of material like this. This was the first virus to be discovered uh, in the 1930s. Uh, so what does a virus consist of? Do you remember that from upper secondary school? Mm, RNA and, and membrane? Mm. Not so much the membrane, but RNA. So what does, I would, I would actually argue, um, uh, viruses is the most important, the most beautiful discovery in nature. It's by far, you can argue whether it's a life form or not because it's not alive. It doesn't really have any turnover like a cell or anything, but it's pure genetic material, right? And it's not like the DNA itself doesn't have any intelligence and it doesn't have any energy. Uh, so you take our pure RNA and then the point, what is the goal of RNA? Yes. Uh, so I'm sorry to tell you, but we are just a fancy way for RNA or DNA to replicate itself. Um, without us, our DNA can't replicate itself. But the problem with RNA, what did I say about RNA when we spoke about nucleic acids? It's fragile, right? It will break down spontaneously. In the lab, we even need to put it on ice. So if you just had the RNA in isolation, it, it would very rapidly break down and it could not infect cells. So you need something to protect the RNA around the virus. And that's what you call the coat. Uh, and that's typically not the membrane, um, but, uh, vi uh, but protein. So what does that RNA in the virus code for? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, but what RNA has to code for something, right? So what does the virus have to code for? What proteins does the virus have to produce? Yes. So the RNA only codes for its code protein. It only codes for itself. And that's the reason why it's such a beautiful form is that you pretty much just have one protein you code for. Uh, so the tobacco mosaic virus just codes for one single four helical bundle. And that's the bundle you saw. And then this is repeated again and again, turn after turn after turn. And that's why you need this almost triangular shape that if you just looked at one of them, it appeared to be disordered and everything. But you need a protein that is very thin. So that's why we can't have helices all the way in. And then further out, you have slightly more room. And then you see you have thousands of these formed into these very long rods. And then you have the RNA spiral inside here, protected. 
This was sold by Rosalind Franklin in 1958. Uh, I think I told you about this <coughs> a slightly less noble way that Watson and Crick kind of borrowed her results. There was this really fun meme posted on Facebook the other day about the class where apparently the teacher had asked the entire class, so what did, what did Watson and Crick discover? And then somebody says from the back of the class, Rosalind Franklin's notes. Um, so there was actually a third Nobel, a second Nobel Prize involved here too, that Wendell Stanley crystallized the tobacco mosaic virus in the 1940s, sometime 46, I think it was, and he got a Nobel Prize for that. The third example, um, actually it's not so much for a little bundle, but it's related to the hemerythrin. Uh, this is one of the hallmark globular proteins, mainly because one of the first proteins to be crystallized, hemoglobin. And you probably know that this is the protein that codes, uh, that binds oxygens in your cells. Hemoglobin is a bit of a complicated protein. It actually consists of four molecules that are identical, and each of these molecules has one of these heme groups or protoporphyrin bound to which you can bind an iron, and that iron in turn binds oxygen. Uh, as a bit of a freak of nature, the two first proteins that we determined the structure of were hemoglobin and myoglobin. And myoglobin is pretty much exactly the same protein, but just one subunit. Do you know what myoglobin does? Sorry? Myoglobin also binds oxygen, but in your muscles. So why do we need two different proteins? That seems like a waste. So this is a famous result by Monod, Weimann, and Changeux. Uh, the problem here is that hemoglobin, do you want hemoglobin to be good or bad at binding oxygen? Who think it should be good at binding oxygen really strong? What would be good with that? There is something that would be good with that. Well, in particular, you could, at some point, they, you are in your lungs, right? And you need to take oxygens from the air and bind it. If you're not good at binding oxygen, you're not going to be very efficient at taking up oxygen, and that's bad, right? So if you can bind oxygen really strong, that's great. You will be able to take up more oxygen and have higher oxygen uptake. This is even something you measure in, uh, in athletics, for instance, the amount of uh, VO2, how much oxygen you can... Uh, when. But the problem is the second you're out in the muscles, now you have the oxygen bound very strongly to hemoglobin. You're not going to let go of that oxygen. So you now have the oxygen and hemoglobin, but that doesn't help because the oxygen doesn't do anything until we have it in the muscle. So nature has solved this with these four subunits. Uh, so what happens is that this molecule can exist in two forms, uh, what you call a tense and relaxed state. So normally, when we don't have any oxygen bound, it occurs in a state that is relaxed. Uh, and then you start binding. And when, when you start binding a little bit of oxygen, one of these subunits starts to move over. So as you're binding, the protein changes its structure a little bit. Uh, and when it changes its structure a little bit, this increases its affinity, how strong it can bind oxygen. So this means that in regions where the oxygen concentration is high, where I start to bind oxygen, that's kind of like kicking me awake. So then I become even better at binding oxygen. Uh, so then the second subunit starts binding oxygen too. Now the remaining two subunits really, really want to bind oxygen because they're left out otherwise. So now you're binding a third and a fourth oxygen molecule too. And that occurs in your lungs. Uh, so that's, we have lots of oxygen pressure in your lungs, so there we take up a lot of oxygen. Now you take this molecule and transport it out to my muscles. In the muscles, I don't have a whole lot of oxygen. So that the first oxygen molecule will instantly be released. But now I started to release oxygen, so now the others, that's kind of like kicking them to sleep instead. So that, guys, you too should let go of your oxygen because it's not very good to bind oxygen here. So suddenly when you're now out in the muscles, the hemoglobin will, it's like a Janus face that it's now going to change it completely. And you know, on second thought, I don't want to bind oxygen at all. Here, you can have it all myoglobin. Uh, and that's how it works. You have high, a molecule that has high affinity for oxygen in the lungs, but low affinity for oxygen out in the muscles. Pretty cool for just a few alpha helices, right? Uh, so each of these small subunits contains roughly six small helices that forms a binding site around this heme group. Uh, and you have a histidine uh, and everything that binds to the iron here. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, and I just explained a little bit about the binding between hemoglobin and myoglobin. Myoglobin only being a single monomer, it doesn't have any of these effects because myoglobin is only in the muscles. Myoglobin should never enter in your lungs. We don't want myoglobin anywhere near the lungs. So if we now look at these four helices, uh, there are different parts of these structures and everything. Um, remember that I said before about introns and exons in your genomes, that there are lots of letters in your alphabet, but not all of them code for amino, uh, for, uh, for amino acids and proteins. If there are now five, six helices here, and then I will show you a genome again, if you don't remember it. In the DNA, X, on, X stands for express, and in here is inactive. Or something. There are these strange regions, they don't seem to do anything, and we don't really know what they do. The other strange thing is that these only occurs in higher organisms, vertebrates. Bacteria don't have introns. Bacteria, I'm sorry to break it again, but if you think that you're a fancy organism, bacteria are far more beautiful than you are. Uh, they're far more efficient than we are. Um, we're basically, we're an old model of a car that should have been replaced a long time ago and bacteria is the latest MacBook or whatever. Uh, so can you imagine what these expressed units correspond to? It would make a lot of sense to assume that they correspond to the secondary structure elements, right? And it's completely wrong. So in hemoglobin, you see that they the first one is the red, the second is the blue, and the third is the yellow. It has no correlation whatsoever to the secondary structure. Because the intron parts, they are cut out by gene scissors far before we even start to fold the protein. And for a very long, this has been a very intense research topic the last 20 years, because we, we obviously know, again, nothing in nature occurs by chance. Those introns must be important, uh, but we haven't really known what they do, and there have been lots of hypotheses. There was a really cool paper that appeared roughly four days before we started this course uh, in Nature, uh, where Abu Elea's team showed that introns appear to be mediators of cell response to starvation. And that's key. So, what happens with the bacteria when they starve? They die or they simply don't replicate. Bacteria are replicated, but bacteria is, bacteria is an extreme form of colony in the sense that the individual is not important, right? But for vertebrates and everything, one difference is we are much better at adapting to changes in our environment. Now that's good for us. You could argue for nature it might be more efficient if we just died uh, and then there are new humans instead. But this is a key difference in vertebrates that you don't have in bacteria. And what they showed here is that by doing fairly simple experiments and trying to cut out the introns and everything, they can show that the, the, the organisms are no longer able to respond as well to starvation. And I'm sure that this is not the last story of it, but just to show that the cool thing with all of these things is not that it happened recently, it's happening as we speak. Um, There's literally a paper that's four weeks old. If this turns out to be right, it could very well be a Nobel Prize in the future, but it's going to take 20 years for that. Uh, I think I already spoke about those helix ridges and growths. I'm not going to go through that in the interest of time, but I will go through this. Um, remember the thing I mentioned that if you had two helices and if we put the hydrophobic residues on the inside, they're going to form something very nice and stable. And this is related to the hem erythrin and everything uh, that was the third example protein I showed you. This works not only for two helices, but it works for three helices. And if you can take a wild guess that it might actually work for four, two, you are completely right. So we can take four helices, and then we somehow turn all the interior parts here into some sort of either hydrophobic. Well, the first approximation, let's make it hydrophobic. But let's add just a few residues that can bind, say, a heme group. Now we have a small protein that is hydrophobic on the inside, hydrophilic on the outside, so soluble in water. It can bind a heme group. What can the heme group in turn bind? We just went through it three slides ago. So unless you were sleeping, you should know the answer. Oxygen. So what could you use that protein for? You can imitate the oxygen binding properties of blood. Uh, and this is used not, again, this is still very, but you can use it to try to create artificial blood. 
and that is being sold in some parts of the world for two reasons. First, there are some religions where people absolutely don't want to receive blood donations. That's probably more of a parenthesis in the grand scheme of things. But there are plenty of cases where it's simply it's difficult to get blood. Uh, human blood has all the problems with different antibodies, not to mention diseases like HIV and uh, hepatitis, uh, hepatitis C and everything that has spread from blood donations historically. So if you could create artificial blood, even it's not at all going to be as efficient as our human blood because they don't have the fanciness of uh, hemoglobin with the multiple states. But again, having something that binds oxygen so that you survive is way better than not having it. You can use it for slightly less fancy things. Um, imagine if we take four helices like this and we forget about the hemoglobin, but we take something that's water soluble on the outside and then we make them fat or oil soluble on the inside. So we can solve it a bit of fatty acids there. What could you use that for? We could get oil and put it in water, right? So why, what, why would that be useful? Mm, um, in theory, yes, but then now we're talking, I think commercial, way simpler stuff, not, not advanced biotech. I bet you all bought this type of products. low fat or low calorie food products. So if you if you're any margarine or something, right, it's fat, fat. So you have a product that consists of fat and I would now like to sell this product but I should reduce the fat contents of fat. That's not entirely easy to do. How do you reduce the fat contents of fat? So you can try to mix it with water and how well does it work to mix fat with water? It doesn't. But if you take this type of proteins, if you know either, you can have it does contain fat, right? But you can have fat in water. So you can mix in a much larger fraction of water in the fat by having these so-called, they're essentially emulsifiers. And you might have seen what happens if you take at least some low calorie food products, low calorie margarine or something, and you try to, say you try to stir fry in it. It used to happen 10 years ago at least. Something strange happens in the pan. It just turns to water or something. You can't fry in it. So what happens with protein when you heat it? It breaks down, it unfolds. And suddenly you release all the water, right? So you now have an oil, you have an oil fat mixture in the pan together with some uh, unfolded protein that will burn. So quite a lot of research, I think particularly even Lund, if I recall correctly, has actually been trying to create proteins like this that are more stable. Because if you can make this protein so stable that it can withstand boiling, you can suddenly boil low calorie products. And I think Arla did that a few years ago. So the latest generation of low calorie products, uh, creme fraiche for instance, you can actually boil it. And again, that looks like, like can't you imagine the amount of money that involves for these companies? And you're basically talking about protein design, industrial protein design on very large scale. Um, it's certainly possible to, now we're talking about pure alpha helix and pure beta sheet domains. It's certainly possible to mix them too. And there are pretty much just two ways of doing that. We can have, either they can be separate. So you have one part that's just helices and one part that's sheet, or you can alternate them. Uh, and when we alternate them, we typically write that as alpha slash beta. And the only difference is that if you alternate them, you would have something like this, that you would have a helix, one strand of the helix go down, and then you need to have a, sorry, one strand of a sheet go down and then you would need a helix to go up on the outside and then it's another strand of the sheet to go down so that they're parallel. Because if you want parallel sheets, you need something to, you basically need something to go back to the start of the sheet. The other alternative is that uh, you could have something like this alcohol de di dehydrogenase. When you hear two, you see that it's parallel beta sheets. So beta sheet and then alpha helix go down, beta sheet up, alpha helix down, etc. What does alcohol dehydrogenase do? It breaks down ethanol. So there's a, and there's a large genetic variation in this all over the globe. Uh, so a large part of the Asian population is a bit deficient in ADH. And that's why they get very intoxicated. They're not as good as you there. I would actually, it's probably us, we are a freak mutation. 
because in the, rest, uh, in the rest of the world, you didn't have to drink that much alcohol. But in the cold north, it was important to be able to drink both milk and alcohol. No, but seriously, because it's, it's energy, right? Uh, but in the rest of the world, it's not that important. That's actually, that's actually why we have a much higher tolerance for lactose. Most other, in the rest of the world, again, you stop, you stop breastfeeding when you're six months old. You don't need it after that. But we came up with the idea that we can steal the energy from the cows. Uh, there are a number of folds like this, and I'm not going to go through them in all detail, but I think that for historical reasons, they're beautiful. And there was, in the 1970s, there was this booming era when we found all these, the alpha, just as we found the sequence and the genetic code, this is basically the structural code of all the proteins. And this is a very old love story for mine, and that's why I have some of the images, but maybe it's not the most important thing to know the folds by heart. But the part that is important to know is that these structures are not random. And throughout these structures, you have binding sites and everything. And virtually all these binding sites, they, they occur on the surface, because otherwise you can't bind things. But they also they tend to occur on the edges of these domains, where you frequently have unpaired hydrogen bonds, or you have several helices pointing to a place where you can really put something charged on top of the helices. So if you were to guess where a binding site or anything is, they're virtually never going to occur right in the middle of the protein, and they're never going to occur right in the middle of a secondary structure element, but typically on edges of secondary structure elements. Uh, the other alternative is that you have structures that are, contain one part that's helix and one part that's beta sheets. So here we have sheet up, down, up, down, up, down, and then you go to the backside as a helix, helix. Uh, you can also have here a helix, 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 and then a couple of sheets, and then one more helix at the end. A beautiful protein that is a Tata binding protein. Uh, this small protein. This is the protein that finds the genes in your DNA. So this will, all these beta sheets, they contain hydrogen bonds, right? So that the beta sheets will bind, they will recognize certain bases in the DNA. And in particular, the, the reason why it's called TATA, there's a TATAA region, and that's where we should initiate transcription. That's a new gene. It's the start of a book in the library. Let's start to read this book. So nature does everything that happens in your body cell. If you don't know what's done, it's a protein doing it. So all these proteins and transcription factors, everything that really, they're pretty much, they're just stupid molecules that are more or less diffusing. A, first they diffuse in three-dimensional space, and then they bind to DNA, and then they diffuse along the DNA, and suddenly they find a pattern, and then they bind to this pattern, and then that starts a chain reaction where something else binds to this protein, and then eventually you split the strands and start transcribing DNA. And that has happened a couple of billion times since we started this lecture. Uh, finally, that although these are the most common structures, there are a bunch of other structures, these horrible, irregular ones. Uh, this is another neurotoxin, a Brazilian scorpion. In some cases, and I think this is one of them, uh, the reason why it's so irregular is likely that this protein will likely form structure once it's binding to my nervous system, which I hope it won't. Um, no, but because if this protein is not very stable itself, right, but once this is binding to, say, my channels or something, if it can form a more stable structure when it's bound to my channels, again, it's not, that's a very strong downhill driving force. Remember what I said, that we need, we have some sort of changes in free energy. And assume that it's a minus 50, minus 50 kilojoules per mole binding advantage if this one is binding to my protein. It's going to bind to my protein and it will never go uphill again because the uphill barrier is too far. And then it is bound and it's not going to knock out my uh, cellular response, uh, my neuronal response. Brazilian scorpion, I can probably survive. Um, something slightly more severe is cobra toxin. I hope Lucy is going to tell you about ligand gated ion channels on Monday, or I will have to, <coughs> I will be upset because those are my pet channels. Um, cobra toxin, they bind to your ligand gated ion channels and they block them so that they can't open. Doesn't matter how much, how much lig uh, ligands you try to activate them with. And that literally means that at the end of one cell, when the signal is supposed to jump to the next nerve cell, the response stops. You literally kill the nerve signal, which is okay if it's just my finger or something, right? But this involves your breathing, your heartbeats, and everything. And that's why it has so grave consequences. Uh, again, it's a beautiful small protein. So I think it's amazing how the animal has been able to do this. Which leads to another problem. Uh, 
if these proteins are so pot potent and everything, uh, a beautiful example is uh, these poisonous frogs. Do you know them in South America? If you pretty much if you just touch the skin of the frog, you will die. They're extremely potent neurotoxins. That's a fun toxin and everything, but how on earth does the frog survive? Because the frog, again, a frog also has a nervous system, maybe not as advanced as yours, but... So how would nature do it? So remember what I said, that this binds to some sort of protein, right? And there is a binding site. We don't know what it is in this case, but forget about that for a second. And there are like three or four residues that are important residues for binding this toxin. And that's the site that this toxin targets. So if you were the frog, what would nature do in the frog? Or mutate them, right? So the frogs have mutations in these sites. So the frog has slightly different signaling in the nervous system. So the frog, of course, still needs signaling. But the frog's own nervous system is mutated a bit so that the frog, do the frog doesn't bind its own toxins. So it can't knock out the uh, nervous system in the frog. And it's possibly the same in the cobras. So it's like, I think it's two residues that are mutated, a tiny change. And the reason for that is that suddenly it's not advantageous in terms of free energy. It would be an uphill barrier to bind, and then it's not going to happen at all. So it all comes down to the free energy. Uh, and you might at this point think that this is insanely complicated. And in one way it is, but there was a famous paper in the early 90s that although we discover more and more proteins, there are like more than 100,000 structures known and hundreds of millions of sequences, the amount of completely separate folds is actually surprisingly small. The Cyrus Shotia wrote a paper called A Thousand Folds for the Molecular Biologist, and that turned out to be wrong. Um, if you think about fold as just the general pattern in which we're doing things, there might be 1,500, maybe 2,000 or something. But as many proteins and as many sequences we can have and as many mutations you can have in the frog, overall there isn't that much diversity. And remember, these, say, let's say that it's 2,000. These 2,000 completely different patterns of building. That's what creates all the diversity in nature from the frogs to the Christmas trees to you and your, the color of your hair or eyes. Uh, which, again, that, and then nature tends to reuse folds all over the place. Um, so that's why you see, for instance, the four helical bundles. They can bind blood, the oxygen in the blood. They can be the coat of the tobacco mosaic virus, or they can be the cytochrome folds. So they think that things that are small and simple and neat building blocks from a physics point of view tend to be reused by nature. And then in general, we will come back to that in bioinformatics, that if you have a reasonable number of sequences, you're going to maintain this fold. Just because you change one residue doesn't mean that it's going to change. So typically, I would say if 30% of the residues in two proteins are the same, you're going to have the same fold. Uh, that is in general true, but remember what I said about molecular biology and examples. There was a famous example in 97 uh, by Lynn Regan. They changed roughly 50% of the residues in a protein, and then they could have it create a different fold. And this is also a bit related to the prions I spoke about and everything. Uh, I think we're, I'm pretty much done today, but I'm going to take two more minutes here. Um, so why did I go through all this protein structure? Well, proteins are important. And you're going to see proteins, even if you want to go into experimental biophysics study spectroscopy. What you're usually doing in spectroscopy is you want to understand what a protein is interacting with. Where in the body is this protein located? And then you would take this small protein and uh, say, attach this more fluorescent probe to it. Or you could add, let's see that these were two different proteins, then you can attach one probe here and one probe here. And if these now happen to be close to each other in space, you would then see a signal that one would convert energy to the other. So it's not just that I'm a geek and happen to be interested in proteins, <coughs> full disclosure I am, but uh, these are literally the building blocks for everything in bio. Just that the atoms is the building blocks in atomic physics and you need to understand the spectra. Almost everything we do has to do with these building blocks. Uh, and they are created entirely from your genome. But that does, is not quite the entire story. So on Monday, Lucy is going to speak about membranes and membrane proteins. So where do you get membranes from? I already showed you some hints about lipid bilayers, right, and cell walls and everything. And the proteins we get from your DNA, but where do you get the, the membranes? Because it's the phospholipids. 
Where do those molecules come from? Yeah. So literally, you are what you eat. Uh, so that if you eat a different diet, you will literally change the composition of your body and your cellular membranes. So if you eat lots of cholesterol, your membranes will become slightly stiffer, which is perfectly fine in your age. But by the time you're to my age, you should probably start to think of your cholesterol intake. Uh, so literally, you can change the composition of your body with your food. You can't change the proteins. That's much more difficult. But the cell walls and everything will change depending on what you eat, which is pretty fun and scary. And that's actually used in a couple of diseases that you can actually treat diseases like epilepsy and everything by altering the food, thereby altering the properties of your membranes, which is pretty cool. There are a bunch of study questions that I won't go through in detail. I think I, many of my figures here are from Finkelstein, but uh, this is reasonably well covered in Nordland too. So make sure, I think the key, you need to have a gut feeling about what proteins are and how all the structural diversity and everything is related to free energy. Because every single structure, the reason a structure occurs is because of free energy. The reason why they bind or not bind something, the frog, is because of free energy. Uh, so try to think of these biological features in terms of physics, uh, because it's all governed by very simple laws, in particular the partition function and the Boltzmann distribution. With that, four minutes early, almost five. Have a nice weekend.